Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar for DMARC and how to get started. My name is Shazad Mirza. I'm the Director of Operations for the New York City Office at Global Cyber Alliance. What we'll talk about this webinar is just give a really quick overview of what DMARC is and show you a short video uh, about how DMARC works. And then we'll get into the, some of the things that you need to take a look at in terms of getting started with DMARC, what things you need for implementa implementing a DMARC. <coughs> Excuse me, and, one, and a few things to take into consideration when you're planning for the implementation of DMARC. And then we'll tell you exactly what type of DNS entry that you'll need in order to get started. And again, as a reminder to everyone, there is a questions box that is available to you in, to, in your GoToWebinar control panel. Please feel free to ask any questions at any point in time during the, the webinar. I'll do my best to answer those questions during the webinar. If I can't get to it during it, I'll leave enough time uh, towards the end of the webinar to be able to answer those questions. So just a, really quickly in terms of what DMARC is, as a reminder, so DMARC is going to be a solution that you're going to use in order to prevent unauthorized users from using your domain name. So it acts like an identity check for your organization's domain name. So this way, no one else can use it. Only the people that you authorize are allowed to use it. So when you're creating a DMARC, one of the things you have to take into account and plan for is there's two parts to DMARC. One part is the DMARC policy, and that's the, where the sender is going to create the policy, so the sending organization, because that policy is going to define that the messages that are being sent to using that domain are protected. And if they're not or don't have the appropriate information or authentication checks in place, they're considered unauthorized. This way, the receiving end knows what to do if one of those authentication mechanisms that DMARC uses passes or fails. That way, they don't have to make that decision, and they will rely on the sending organizations that make that, that decision. So that way, you, had, as a sending organization, has control of what's happening with the messages that are being delivered and the messages that are being sent out. So before we go into any further, I just want to show you a really quick video. It's about a minute and a half that's going to just talk about how DMARC works. DMARC is an email authentication tool that protects your company's email domain from being used in phishing scams, spam attacks, and other cyber crimes. DMARC improves the delivery rate of the email you send to your customers, and it helps to protect your internal network. The benefits are clear, but how does it actually work? Let's take a look. A DMARC policy adds metadata to every email your organization sends. The metadata tells the recipient's email server that each message is authentic. The recipient server checks this metadata and checks the sending organization's DMARC policy on how to handle each message. If the server detects no DMARC policy, or if the policy is set to none, the message is generally delivered to the intended recipient's inbox. If the policy is set to quarantine and authentication checks fail, the message is routed to spam. If the policy is set to reject and authentication checks fail, the message will be blocked and will not be delivered at all. The Global Cyber Alliance has created a free DMARC setup guide to help you implement a DMARC policy on your organization's email domain. Just enter your email domain, then follow the steps. In the process, you'll be able to configure additional authentication records using Sender Policy Framework, SPF, and Domain Keys Identified Mail, DKIM. Once complete, your outbound messages will be easily validated by recipient servers, and you'll more effectively determine the authenticity of inbound email. Send safely and say no to spam. Set up DMARC today. So that was just a really, really quick overview and high-level overview of what DMARC is and how DMARC works. So we're not going to go into the technical deep dive of DMARC in this webinar. We have other webinars in which we will do that. Um, and I'll tell you what those webinars are towards the end of this uh, the, the webinar. So a, a few things, so before getting started, so like one thing is you should have a good understanding of DMARC. So hopefully that video gave you some level of what's going on. But the thing you need to also understand is, is that there's two parts to DMARC or two sides to DMARC. There's the policy side and there's the verification side. So really, as an organization, you're going to set up both because you are your organization is a sending is a sender and is also a receiver of messages. So the DMARC policy is on the sender side, and the policy is going to define what happens with the messages that you're sending out to uh, to other organizations or other partners or uh, consumers and citizens. The verification part is for all the messages that you're that are incoming to or you, to you from other organizations and other sources that hopefully have DMARC implemented on their end. So this way, every email coming in, you can check to see, 
okay, does it have DMARC? What's the policy level? Should we trust this message or should we not trust this message? The other thing you need to know about your own environment is how your email systems work and how your networking environment works. Because there's two parts that in, that in order for DMARC to work that you need to have, which are your email and your DNS, your domain name service. So those are things that you need to do in order to have in for implementation. So you need to have access to your public DNS for organizations, for your organization. So public DNS meaning you'll have in most cases there'll be an internal DNS system and there'll be an external DNS system. <clears throat> the external system is the one that the public can actually access to get information about your domain. So whether it be www. or your mail servers and things like that. So you'll need access there because that's where the DMARC policy is going to be applied. You may need access to your email systems or your servers uh, for your organization. And the reason for that is because it could be where you may have to implement or uh, develop, put th th certain authentication mechanisms onto that systems, onto that server. For example, DKIM, which is domain key identified messages, one part of the authentication mechanism that DMARC uses. DKIM is uh, typically a server side uh, a server side signature that's being implemented so that way every message going out is being signed and the server is going to be the one that sends out those messages so you need to have access to make sure that you can actually implement that and do that now it is going to be different when it comes to an internally hosted mail server and a cloud mail service provider as well and we'll talk about that in the next few slides another thing that we recommend that you have before implementation it's not really necessary to have the complete entire list, but have a list of the email domains that you use. So what domains are actually used for email purposes, right? Because it may not be just the one main domain that you have. You may, if you're a global organization or a national organization, you may have multiple versions of that email domain. But on the same side, you should consider having all your public domains, even those that are not used for email. Why? Because DMARC can still protect those domains as well. Because so, for example, uh, for Global Cyber Alliance, we have globalcyberalliance.org. That's our main uh, email item that we use. But then we also registered gotdmark.org. But we don't actually use that for email. We actually just ended up using those for videos and things like that. But it's not for email purposes whatsoever. So we were still able to apply a DMARC policy on that at the highest level in order to prevent people from using that to domain. And so not only external users cannot use that, but even your own internal users can't use that until there is authorization to be able to use those for email purposes. Subdomains, if you have any. So that's one thing you need to consider. And subdomains, I mean, in terms of public subdomains, it doesn't necessarily have to be your internal subdomains. It should be the ones that are publicly facing. Because you can protect each subdomain by using a DMARC policy as well. The, default the DMARC policy that you apply at the top level domain will apply to all of your subdomains as well. But there are cases where the subdomains may be in a different entity or a different agency in, in terms of government aspects. So they may they will need to be responsible for those sub-level domains. So you have to be careful when you apply to the top level and then making sure that the sub-level domains are applied as well. And any third party mail providers. So if you're using things like Salesforce, MailChimp, Constant Contact, or any other types of marketing type uh, email providers that are out there that are not, you know, so that way messages aren't necessarily going through all of your, your email, uh, so your, your email servers, you should have a list of those. Now, what if you don't have a list? I mean, do your best as you can if you have that to get that list um, beforehand, because it may, it'll save you some time later on to fix it. But the nice thing about DMARC is it has a reporting capability as well. And that reports can tell you if what some of this information as well. So that way if you don't know what third party mail server providers there are, well, the reports are gonna tell you, hey, look, there's, there seems to be messages coming from MailChimp. This way then you can determine, okay, who is using, who in your organization is using MailChimp? If they're not, if nobody responds, then we'll basically, if you go to the highest level, MailChimp can no longer be used. So somebody at some point is going to have to say, hey, we're actually using it, so uh, we need this to be authorized. So it's the nice thing about DMARC. It gives you that reporting capability, and then it gives you that control over who, who, you know, who's sending email using your, your domain. <clears throat> so some other things to plan for. 
So when it comes to DMARC, it uses two other authentication protocols. One I already mentioned, which is DKIM. The other one is SPF, which is Sender Policy Framework. Sender Policy Framework is the one is the policy you could apply that is going to be the list of authorized servers, IPs, and domains that are can send on your behalf. So that's why it's important to have that list because you get to add those items into your SPF policy. Then also understand what the three levels of the three policy levels for DMARC. So there's three levels that are out there. There's none, quarantine, and reject. Our recommendation is if you're not fully aware of your environment and for safety reasons, always start your policy at the lowest level, which is called none. What that does is it puts it into monitor mode. So that way you can get reports and review those reports and then see what adjustments need to be made. So that way if things are missing from your list of domains that you have, you can always add to that list and check with teams or, or uh, people within your organization if this is an authorized uh, third party or if this is an authorized server that you weren't aware of. So take that into account. And then another thing is, is does your email server support DKIM? So not all email servers will support DKIM, especially if you have internal uh, servers. Cloud service providers, majority of them are now supporting DKIM, so it's built into it. You just have to go and enable it or do a few things in order to get it to work. But then, like Microsoft Exchange, for example, if you have an internally hosted Microsoft Exchange server, it does not support DKIM. You're going to need to use third-party providing tools, uh, open source tools, that will give you that additional support. But just note, though, if you're using Office 365, DKIM is supported because it's built into that cloud service. The other part of DKIM is there's different sizes of key length. In most cases, it's either 1024 or 2048. It should be one or the, one or the two. Uh, it's not typically any anything else. But the, why does the key length matter? Because not all DNS domain name services support 2048 length for DKIM. Majority and all of them do support 1024. So you have to take that into account as well. Obviously, the higher the number, the the, the stronger the key will be. But don't go any lower, lower than 1024. And there are going to be potential unknowns as you go through this and through the entire process when you implement DMARC. And those are going to be, like, is your organization using third-party vendors? And do those third-party vendors support SPF and or DKIM? A lot of third-party uh, email providers are supporting SPF and DKIM, but there might be one or two that are out there that will, may not support it. So you have to take that into account. And then also mail systems that IT staff is unaware of. Because there might be, there's one organization that actually put in DMARC and they put it at the lowest level of nine and reviewed the reports. And they found this one system that's been sitting somewhere in some back corner that was actually used to send out mail. It's a legacy system. And they weren't aware, of, they completely forgot that it actually existed. So they found it, they, that, it, that this is something that's sending out mail and actually something that was valid and needed, to, and needed to be still up and running, even though it was a legacy system. So they just added it to their SPF and made whatever adjustments that they need to do so that way it can actually send out messages. Take into account your subdomains and take that into consideration as well because you may want to consider creating a DMARC policy for subdomains. And, but the only time you may want to consider doing this is if you have multiple IT departments for each subdomain. So if, you, if again, this is more for, could most likely get to impact more global type organizations and maybe government type entities uh, because there is going to be a top level domain and then some, I know in government, some uh, agencies will be separate from the top level and have their own IT shops and own email shops. So they're going to be need to be responsible for sub, those subdomains because if you apply it to the top level, that will automatically apply to your subdomains. And then there's those IT and email uh, groups for those subdomains are going to have a hard time trying to figure out what's going on with their messages. So they, because they need to make the changes, they need to look at third parties as well and see if there's any mail systems that need to be added and, and so on. So you have to take that into consideration. And plan for public domains not used for email. So apply a DMARC reject policy to those. If you're not using a public a, a domain, apply the policy to it because then that prevents anyone else from using it or even using those variations of your new domain. So if you have a .gov, if you own a .com, .org, .net version of that, apply a DMARC policy that even though you're not using it for, uh, 
for email purposes because that way again you're further protecting those domains and preventing spammers and fishers from using those variations if you don't own a variation of that domain consider purchasing it I mean domains are fairly cheap at nowadays if you just find the right site the right domain registrar you can get a domain for a dollar per year in some cases so take that into account and buy those and then apply a DMARC policy to those as well and then plan for report analysis because report analysis is going to be a very key component to this whole process and that's really the really major power and benefit of using DMARC those reports are going to tell you what's going on with your messages so all the recipients are going to send back um, at least one report back to you on a daily basis so that we can take a look at it and see what's going on and the reason we're, I'm pointing this out is not in terms of just to determine what's going on with SPF and DKIM but you also have to take into account that there's a potential that you may get a large number of reports so you have to consider take that into consideration and, and plan for that how do you plan for it look at how many messages you send out on a daily basis so most servers and SMTP gateways will give you reports and tell you if, if you're sending 100 messages, 1,000, a million messages on a daily basis. The more and more messages you send out and the more different domains you're sending them out to, the more reports you're going to get back. So you have to take that into consideration because report analysis could be something that's going to be time consuming uh, for your organization. So there are free tools that are available to do the analysis, but there are also vendors available as well that will help you with those analysis, that, that analysis uh, and, as well. So those are things to take into account when you're uh, creating and planning for implementing DMARC. So it's not just DMARC you have to worry about. There's two other protocols, SPF and DKIM, and other little components to take into consideration. Now, the approach may be different when you have internal and cloud mail versus cloud mail uh, services. So for internal mail services, the things you need to take into account is you need to collect domains and IP addresses for, uh, for SPF. So you need to know what they are because those are the ones that are going to be allowed to send it. In most cases, you can use what it's called in DNS. It's called an MX record. That's your mail exchange record. So those are the mail servers that are authorized to send mail on your behalf. So you may be able to just get away with an SPS just putting the MX tag in there rather than listing all the domains and IP addresses. The only time you have to list IPs and domains if they're ones that are not in your MX record. So it could be you know, the developer systems that are not, you know, you, that don't commonly send mail. So you may just have to put in the IP address for it. The domains are probably are going to be your third party providers or any other uh, domains that send mail on your behalf. And the other things you have to determine is determine if the mail server supports DKIM. So like I mentioned before, in Microsoft Exchange, if you're hosting it internally within yourself, within your own organization, it doesn't support DKIM by default. So other ones like SendGrid don't support by default, but SendGrid has an add-on for DKIM, so you can actually put that in. For MS Exchange, you actually have to use open source products in order to incorporate DKIM capabilities into it. And also determine if the mail server supports DMARC verification, right? You have to have, you want to check for incoming messages. You want to see what other people are sending you if they have DMARC capabilities. So you want to verify that and have that built in. In most cases, it's not the mail server side that's going to be the one responsible for it. It's going to be the SMTP gateways that are responsible for it, like your Cisco Iron ports, your Mimecast systems. In some cases, anti phishing and anti spam systems will also do DMARC verification for you as well. So you want to take a look at those capabilities and see if those are, are available to you. And there are some mail servers, I believe SendGrid might be one that is actually does support DMARC verification, but in most cases people will have those SMTP gateways. So you want to enable DMARC verification there as well. And also in terms of DKIM as well, if you do have an SMTP gateway, most SMTP gateways will have DKIM capabilities. So you may want to consider using that because in that way it saves you time from implementing in your servers. And then any messages that go through the gateway will, will be signed um, using your DKIM key. Now on cloud mail service providers, they'll provide you with a lot of the information. So it's good to use their knowledge base for SPF and DKIM because in SPF they'll tell you exactly what their SPF, what the SPF policy should look like with, with and including their information. Some cases with DKIM, they'll handle it for you as well. So for example, like in Office 365 and Google G Suites, they handle the DKIM, for, key, DKIM keys for you. They'll just give you what the DNS record should look like so what the public key record should look like and you need to put into DNS so they handle all of it for you so you need to follow their instructions and follow their rules because that's how it gets created and how it gets done 
in some cases, cloud mail service providers, you may have to contact them and give them a call, and they'll do and they'll set up everything and tell you what to go through the process. So make sure you use their knowledge base to determine what's going on. Um, also for DMARC verification, a lot of the cloud mail service providers will do def by default do a DMARC verification for you. So they will check all the incoming messages for DMARC and see if there's a DMARC policy applied to any of them. So I know Office 365 does it, Google G Suites does it, I think Yahoo Business Mail does it as well. But the other side of the house is too, is that when it comes to cloud mail services, if you're using a consumer-based mail service, so like yahoo.com, gmail.com, uh, outlook.com, live.com, hotmail.com, you don't need to apply DMARC to those because you don't have control over those domains. Who controls those domains? Yahoo does or Google does and Microsoft, they control those domains. And those are consumer based. They're going to apply a DMARC policy to those domains as they need to. Majority of them are already set to the lowest level at none, but it's going to take time for them to get up to a higher level because they have to take into account quite a lot of things uh, when it comes to uh, implementing uh, uh, an enforced DMARC policy on a consumer based mail service. So take that into account as well. But, you know, so DMARC will work on Office 365, Google G Suites. The reason being because you are in control of that domain. You're applying a domain to that, uh, a business-based email service to one of those services. So really, in order to get started right away, all you really need to do is create this one entry in your DNS as a TXT record. So you just go in and put in a host called underscore DMARC. In some cases, you may have to put your actual domain name, so underscore DMARC.globalcyberlines.org, for example. Just take into account your DNS system, and you might just need underscore DMARC. And then implement the value. A version equals DMARC1. Put in a policy level of none, so that way no mail is impacted while you're doing the, the uh, analysis of your reports and making sure everything works. And then you have the RUA tag and the RUF tag to get those reports. So the RUA tag is for aggregate reports, which is you absolutely definitely want to get. That's going to have the majority of the information of what's going on with the messages, which ones are passing, which ones are failing, why they're passing, why they're failing. RUF is more forensic reports. That's up to you whether you want those because not many people actually send forensic reports. And then I added the last tag of SP equals reject. Be careful with that last tag. SP equals reject should only be there if you do not, I repeat, do not have subdomains, okay? Otherwise, do not use SP equals reject. The P equals none tag is what will apply to your domain and to your subdomains. So SP equals reject only if you do not use subdomains. So be very careful with that. So to continue on, so again, this is a reminder that we do have our 90 days to DMARC at the Global Cyber Alliance Challenge. It is still ongoing. We're almost done with the first month. We're going to provide quite a lot more information as we go along. There's a URL at the bottom of the screen there. If you have not signed up, feel free to sign up so that way you can get direct emails about the upcoming webinars and uh, services that are provided to you as well. Uh, you can actually go to dmark.globalcyberalliance.org. We have a 90-day challenge banner there as well. Uh, we'll be updating that uh, banner uh, hopefully today with uh, additional information about all the webinars and links to uh, some of our partner vendors who are providing 90-day free services uh, for, their, for their reporting capabilities and reporting tools. Some other resources that are available to you, obviously dmark.org is one of the great sites to use. I go to GCA, so again, the DMARC site that we have, we'll be posting more information and more resources there as well. Um, we also have our we monthly webinar, which is next week on December 20th. That will be more of a deep dive into DMARC. So we'll talk about the different components. We'll talk about the tags that I mentioned before in more detail. We'll talk about the SPF. We'll talk about DKIM. Uh, we'll talk about the different the reporting mechanisms. So the different reporting reports that are available. Give you links to free tools as well as information about the DMARC ven the, the, the DMARC vendors that are our GCA partners. So this is next week at 8 a.m. and 2:30 p.m. Eastern on December 20th. To register, just go to the DMARC website. About halfway down, there'll be a, a large video that you'll see, and right underneath that video will be a link to register. We have our DMARC setup guide to help you get through the process as well. It's dmarcguide.globalcyberalliance.org. And also on December 20th, that webinar will give you a quick demo of that as well on how to use it. 
Uh, please go through that when you're setting up your DMR policy so that way you have a better understanding of what each of the tags mean and make sure we set that up, you set that up appropriately. Uh, you have the YouTube channel as well, so the Global Cyber Alliance has a YouTube channel. We have quite a few things on there. We have webinars on there. Uh, this webinar will probably be posted on there. Uh, we have how to set up DMARC using Office 365, how to set up DMARC using uh, Global, uh, sorry, uh, Google G Suites. And we're actually, it's a step-by-step -step guide, so we'll actually use Google G Suites to set up, show you how to do as, and Google G Suites and Office 365 and alongside with GoDaddy. So we'll go through the SPF, we'll look at the SPF, look at the record and put in the record in GoDaddy. Same thing with DKIM, we'll show you in both Google G Suites and Office 365 how to implement, how to enable DKIM, how to set it up, and then how to create the DKIM key as well in GoDaddy. And then lastly, how to create the DMARC policy using GoDaddy. We use GoDaddy, but it's going to be a similar process for other types of services, uh, DNS services as well. And again, with it, throughout the 90-day challenge, we're going to provide more and more resources. We'll have additional uh, panels and webinars coming up in January as well. So we're going to have another industry panel there, which will talk about the actual implementation process. We'll have people from different organizations. They'll talk about the processes that they went through and, the, and the, some of the hurdles that they went through when they actually did implement DMARC and what happened afterwards. Uh, so those are the things we're going to do and then in the webinar in January will also be okay now that you have this plan How do you actually go through the implementation process and what you need to do? So at this point I'm going to open up the questions um, If you have any questions feel again, please feel free to post those questions on the Questions box that you have available and we'll do our best to questions in there. So there is a question here. As I'm saying, the question is, is, would you recommend DMARC for organizations of all sizes or only large organizations? I actually recommend that it should be for all sizes. It doesn't matter who you are. Even if you're a little bagel shop in the corner of New York City, that is, if you have a domain, you need to implement DMARC because you're going to protect yourself with that. It shouldn't just be medium and large size organizations. Reason being is, like, if you think about it, if you're just a bagel shop sitting in the corner of a, New York, a street in New York City, and you send out messages, say you send out marketing material to, to people or people who sign up who want you know, information from you. Last thing you need is to have a spammer or a fisher send out a 50% coupon to all of the, uh, all the people that are out there and they come to the, now you come to your shop with a 50% coupon and saying, well, this came from you guys and it's, here's, your, here's the email, here's your domain name. So what choice does that small business have? They have to honor that and now they're going to lose profits and lose money. So everybody is impacted by this. Everybody needs to do to implement a DMARC at this point. Another question is, is who in my organization can implement DMARC for you? Really, it depends on who, I mean, if you have familiarity, where, familiarity of using DNS, then you can do that. I mean, it should be someone that has some level of IT knowledge or IT capability. If you can't do it yourself, take a look and reach out to other people in terms of who can help you out with doing it, or at least guide you through the process of doing the implementation. So you can always reach out to GCA, and there's also, again, those DMARC vendors that can help you as well. The DMARC vendors can go out there and help you implement the, the DMARC policies and get that in set up to you. In most cases, they can actually help, the DMARC vendors can actually probably help you do it much quicker than you can do it on your own. Um, so since so they take that into account, um, and again, with the vendors, we have the 90-day free services, so take advantage of that. I mean, that, serve, that free capability ends February 28th. So after that, you know, you, there's going to be some level of cost in terms of getting additional guidance and help from those DMR vendors. But you can always reach out to us. We'll help at GCA. We'll do it still for free, but we only guide you with it. We will not do the actual implementation. We'll take a look and tell you, okay, this is where you made a mistake and this is where the errors are. So great questions. If there's any other questions, please feel free to ask. I know we're a minute over uh, the 30 minutes for the webinar, but I'm happy to stay on for a little bit. Um, if you don't think of anything now, if you have questions afterwards, here are two email addresses you can contact us at. One is gca-dmark at globalcyberalliance.org. That goes to our entire tech team as well as myself. Or you can feel free to email me directly at smirza at globalcyberalliance.org. I will be more than happy to help with uh, doing what I can to get you started with the implementation process and get you where you need to get to uh, with the mark, at least getting up to none, and then give you some level of guidance to get up to the highest levels of, of quarantine or reject. 
So another question is, is there a risk that when I implement DMARC, my legitimate emails will get blocked? There is a risk that legitimate emails could get blocked. It's a, if done correctly, this should be a very minimal risk, if no risk at all. So that's why it's important. Be careful when you're doing this. When you start off with none, review those reports. And those reports will give you the information you need. And they'll don't. And even if you go to quarantine or reject because you feel comfortable now that you've covered everything, even if you're re, are re, at the highest level of reject, you can still get those reports and still review those reports and make sure and continuously update your SPF and DCAM as you need to. But in most cases that we've seen when it comes to legitimate emails getting blocked, it really ends up being either user error or a syntax error. So something's mistyped. So like for example, quarantine gets mistyped. So that can cause issues. Uh, there's a space or a semicolon that's missing in the, in the policy. That can create issues. But as long as all those things are covered, you shouldn't, there should be a very minimal risk of legitimate emails getting blocked. In most cases I've seen, it ends up being the third party messages because someone at the marketing team forgot that they actually use MailChimp because they only use it maybe once a quarter or once every six months. So, but again, those reports will give you that information and you can fit, rectify those relatively quickly. We'll also talk about other things and concerns and implementation if you join the webinar that's on uh, the December 20th uh, because I mean we do say that DMARC is not necessarily a silver bullet. Um, it's, if you know cybersecurity, nothing really is considered a silver bullet. If they consider a silver bullet, you have to rethink things a little bit. So, but we'll talk about more of those and more things than that in, uh, in the hour long webinar next week. Question is, is when we move to quarantine, do we still receive reports? Yes, you can receive reports at any level of the DMARC policy. And I do strongly recommend that you keep receiving those reports no matter which level you, you, you set your policy to. Because again, I mean, even at quarantine or reject, I mean, yes, you may not be looking at those reports as often as you would when you're starting off at none, but those reports will still have valuable information that you can use. And you can also use that information to share with the community. Because you'll not only get which are the valid ones and get still keep getting information on which ones are the valid services because you'll still get those in the aggregate reports. They'll still tell you that these are valid mails and that you're sending, that they're passing DCAM, passing DMAR, passing SPF. But then you still have your spammers and your fishers that are in those. Hopefully those are the ones that are unauthorized. You can take those unauthorized ones, put them into a block list, put them into your spam or anti-spam and anti-filter tools because they may not be using your domain, but they could use other domains as well. So put those IPs in there and there, you've, there now you're protecting yourself even further, right? And then share that information with other people as well. If you have it's groups that are sector-based groups, send that, share it with them and then they can spread it out to the rest of the other partners within that sector. And now you have even, you're doing more information sharing at that point as well. So yes, I mean, you can still get those reports because at quarantine and at the highest level of reject. Great questions. So I'll leave it open for a few more minutes. I know people are starting to drop off. So um, if there are, again, if there are any questions, feel free to post them. I'll stay on a little bit longer. If, if you don't want to, if there's no questions at this point, again, feel free to email me at smears at globalcyberalliance.org.